fireball erupted when a small plane crashed into an Ohio car dealership. The pilot and passenger did not survive, and tonight authorities are investigating what went wrong. The Iranian climber causing international alarm after competing without wearing a hijab. She's now apologizing for what she called an accident, but some remain concerned for her safety as protests continue in defiance of Iran's oppressive regime. The sprint to the midterms, now just three weeks away. We're on the trail in the key battleground of Pennsylvania as President Biden vows to codify abortion access if Democrats keep their congressional majorities. His message to voters, remember how you felt the day the Dobbs decision came down. Massive blackouts after another wave of deadly drone strikes across Ukraine. President Zelensky says power has been knocked out to 30 percent of the country as winter looms. The child care crisis, the number of jobs may be back to pre-pandemic levels, but not when it comes to taking care of children. We take a closer look at what's driving the shortage. It's physically, mentally, emotionally hard work. Um, and it's one of the lowest paid jobs in every single state in the country. And how some hope to fix the problem. Last Dance, actress Selma Blair, who publicly revealed her MS diagnosis in 2018, bids an emotional farewell from Dancing with the Stars with the pain just too much to bear, but not before an inspiring final performance. And my conversation with Chelsea Manning, the former soldier who spent years in prison for leaking classified military documents, she now tells her story in a new book, from her childhood and decision to share the military's darkest secrets to her message to trans kids everywhere. You know, I just needed somebody to tell me that I was loved and appreciated for who I am, and that that's all I wanted to say to them, is that you are loved, you are appreciated, and um, that there is a community. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Just 21 days until Americans cast their votes in the midterm elections, but we do begin tonight overseas in Iran, where citizens there are using their voices to speak out, in some cases risking their lives to do so. And there are now concerns about an Iranian athlete after her apparent act of defiance over the weekend. Climber Elnaz Rakabi competed in Seoul Sunday without wearing a hijab. Today, she posted a story on Instagram saying she is returning to Iran and to apologizing, saying her head covering inadvertently came off, but no one has been able to reach her. It comes as massive anti-government protests were sparked after 22-year-old Masa Amini died in police custody. Five weeks later, protests continue. Amini was arrested for allegedly wearing her hijab improperly. Since her death, thousands have taken to the streets across the country. And it's still unclear just what caused a fatal fire over the weekend at the notorious prison that is the main holding facility for political detainees. Tensions inside the repressive country are at their highest point in more than a decade. Some suggest the country is at or heading toward a tipping point. Marcus Moore leads us off tonight with the latest. Tonight, Iranian climber Elnaz Rekabi, who competed in Seoul without a hijab in violation of Iran's dress code, has not been seen since. It was believed she was traveling back to Iran with the team, but tonight, still no word on where she is. The climber had reportedly stopped answering phone calls. But today, Rekabi apologizing on Instagram, writing, quote, due to bad timing and the unanticipated call for me to climb the wall, my head covering inadvertently came off. But the move was widely seen as an act of defiance in solidarity with protests across Iran, sparked by the death of Mahsa Amini in the custody of the morality police who arrested her for violating the dress code. Critics of the government believe Rekabi's apology was forced and now fear she faces punishment. What can happen to her is, first of all, to be sent to prison. She can be forced to confess in front of the camera for national TV. There's so many speculating about her safety at this point. Marcus Moore joins us now from London. Uh, Marcus, what do we know about the climber's family back in Iran? Well, Lindsay, we know, uh, according to a website that is, has links or ties to the Iranian government, they're quoting her brother as saying that when she returns home, she will hold a news conference to explain what happened. Lindsay. All right. We'll be watching, Marcus. Our thanks to you. For more on this case and ongoing protests in Iran, I want to welcome back journalist, author, and Iran-American activist Masi Alinejad. 
So thank you so much for being here. You've told Pleasure. your story uh, and shared that with us before. And, and so now I want to really focus in particular the Instagram story uh, that we saw from Elnaz Rakabi. She said she was returning to Iran from Seoul and apologized for a problem with her hijab during the competition that happened, quote, unintentionally. Now, we know that Iran does have a history of forcing people yep. to apologize. What do you think has happened here? Has she been coerced? First of all, I have to say that her act was clear. Yes. It was the, one of the most peaceful act of civil disobedience. She refused to wear forced hijab in support of many teenagers, young women in Iran who are getting killed just because of showing their hair. She was so brave. What happened to her after she refused wearing hijab, she became a hero. Mm -hmm. Millions of people were like seeing her as a role model. So that scares the regime. Friends and family didn't know where she was. Report says that then her brother was hostage. Took, uh, the government took her brother to convince her to go back to Iran. So what you uh, read actually through her Instagram, we call it forced confession. Mm -hmm. Do you believe she's safe? Now, not only me, millions of Iranians, they're worried mm -hmm. for her safety, you know, because we don't know what the government is going to do to her. We know that killing, torturing, jailing people for just showing their hair or expressing themselves, it's in the DNA of the Islamic Republic. And of course, this is all happening in response to the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini, who wore her hijab too loosely, according to the morality police there. She was then arrested and killed. Subsequently, there have been uh, mass protests throughout the country. What do you think is the significance of what it is that, that we're witnessing? First of all, I, I want to really ask you a simple question. Can you believe this is happening in 21st century and then we are talking no. about women are getting killed for your hair. People make sure in my country that the, sh the hair is not shown. You know, the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei said that for us, hijab is more important than the medals that our female athletes mm. will bring from outside the world. And El Naz humiliated him. And, and you mentioned about Mahsa Amini, she even didn't do anything. She was like, uh, she, she was a Kurdish girl, came to Tehran for a vacation with, alongside uh, her, her brother. After two hours, she got arrested and beaten up, according to her family members, and then her dead body was given to her family. I cannot believe that in 21st century, we are talking about this. And, and so people are showing their solidarity. Are you surprised at all that women are risking their lives now to basically bear their hair? First of all, solidarity is beautiful. The sense of unity that we see among the world, it empowers millions of Iranians inside. But what is missing here, that people are bravely burning headscarves, risking their lives, but we need a strong action. Now there is a petition going out around Iranians, like now half a million Iranians signed this petition and asking the democratic countries, this is the time. Kick out the Islamic Republic diplomats from the Western countries and close their embassies. Recall your ambassadors. That is how you sending the right signal to the murderers of these people. So you would say that the U.S. needs to do more. There's a responsibility to do more. Not only uh, for Iranians. Don't get me wrong. This is a revolution mm. against theocracy against religious dictatorship. And believe me, believe me, if the Western countries do not get united to end Islamic terror, then they will face all these Islamic terrorists on US soil. To protect democracy, I think democratic countries should stick with their values. How far will this regime go to crack down on those who speak out? How do you see this ending? To be honest, Iranians are uh, ready to sacrifice their life to end this regime. I see that by watching all, all the videos that young teenagers are saying that Mi miram, mi jangam, zellat nemi paziram. The slogan says that I will fight, i rather die, but not live with humiliation. Mm. They, these are the generations they, they take to the street across Iran. Women are getting raped at the age of nine in the name of marriage. Women are getting kicked out from everywhere. And the whole world should understand that that we will end the gender apartheid regime. We would rather die than live in humiliation. That's that the slogan. So powerful.
Massive, we thank you so much for your time and, and insight and your passion. It's clear. Thank it's you. personal for me, for you as a woman as well. And thank you so much for covering this news. This is a historical moment for Iranians. Thank you. We are three weeks until the midterm election and some key races are heating up tonight in Pennsylvania. The battle for that open Senate seat between Democrat John Fetterman and Republican Dr. Oz. It's continuing to tighten Fetterman's health and whether Oz is a true Pennsylvanian are issues, issues at the forefront of that campaign. Mary Bruce reports in from Pennsylvania. It's a race that could decide the balance of power in Congress, the battle for the open Senate seat in Pennsylvania. Today, we tried to catch up with the Republican candidate, TV's Dr. Mehmet Oz. In the final three weeks of the race, Oz is laser focused on one issue, casting his opponent, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, as soft on crime. It is shocking that in dozens of cases, he tried to free individuals from their life sentences even over the objections of other members of the parole board. His events tightly controlled. Dr. Oz. Thank you. Dr. Oz, will you answer questions, Dr. Oz? But he was off to another event, a community meeting on fighting illegal drugs. My pledge, because I'm running for a, a Senate seat at the federal level, will be to, uh, force, for, to be forceful in our closure of the border. Dr. Oz, Afterwards, he was quickly whisked away. Yep. Is that him? Yep, there he goes. <laughs> Two events, no questions from reporters. A sign of the high stakes both candidates carefully managed. Today, Fetterman also refused to take our questions. After suffering a stroke in May, he only recently got back on the campaign trail in full force. So what I'm asked, is he improving or not? I don't know, because nobody knows. Fetterman brushing it off. Dr. Oz has never stopped reminding me about having a stroke. You know, what kind of a doctor roots for somebody that was sick? Stay sick. Fetterman, who's done one recent TV interview with the help of closed captioning, says his stroke gives him new perspective. Now, after having that stroke, I really understand, you know, much more kind of the challenges that Americans have day in and day out because healthcare saved my life. Fetterman has been trolling Oz for being an outsider with 10 homes in multiple states. He only moved to Pennsylvania after announcing his campaign. How many is going to the Eagles game tomorrow? Anyone? Keep an eye out, there's a billboard near the lick that it shows that Dr. Oz is a Cowboys fan. <laughs> that message sinking in for some voters. What do you make of Dr. Oz? Uh, my problem with Dr. Oz might be a nice man, but I don't like someone coming from another state, New Jersey, coming in to run for office. I, I really feel that that is his number one drawback. He's not a true Pennsylvanian. But that doesn't matter to Bob Rinkowski, who says he's voting for Oz. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, what's the difference? I think Fetterman's just doing that because he can't campaign on anything. Let's get right to Mary Bruce in Pennsylvania. Uh, Mary, I went running with Dr. Oz just a few weeks ago, and for what it's worth, he told me that he's an Eagles fan. He also defended his status as a Pennsylvanian and a resident of Bryn Athen, but it appears that some voters remain skeptical. Yeah, we talked to some voters today that say that it does matter to them where Oz lives and how recently he moved to this state. They feel that he can't really represent them. But on the flip side, I also talked to some Oz supporters who say that they think that this is all just a made-up attack from Fetterman, who one voter told me simply, you know, doesn't have anything else to, else to, to hit him on, as you heard there. So it is very unclear where this race is going to go. We have three more weeks. The race, the polls are tightening. Fetterman is, though, up in the polls. You can hear him talking behind me. And, of course, he will be joined by the president here at an event in Pennsylvania on Thursday. It's unclear though if they're going to be seen together publicly on camera. Fetterman now, like most Democrats, making that careful calculation about whether an appearance with Joe Biden will help him or hurt him. Lindsay. Sounds like Fetterman is making lots of jokes in there, keeping the crowd in, uh, lots of laughter at least. Mary Bruce, our thanks to you. For many Democrats, the right to an abortion is a top issue, and tonight President Biden has made a pledge that if his party holds Congress, that the first bill he sends will protect that right. Here's ABC's senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. Tonight, President Biden with a last-ditch effort before the midterms to rally voters who support abortion rights, promising that Democrats will pass a federal law guaranteeing the right to choose abortion if they win at the polls. Right now... We're short a handful of votes. 
you care about the right to choose, then you got to vote. Just three weeks from Election Day, the president is trying to galvanize voters by focusing on abortion, pointing to the restrictions already put in place in at least 14 states where nearly all abortion services have ceased since Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court in June. The only sure way to stop these extremist laws that are put in jeopardy women's health and rights is for Congress to pass a law. The president warned that if Republicans take power, they will try to ban abortion at 15 weeks nationwide, noting that Senate Republicans like Lindsey Graham have already introduced such a bill and arguing that only more Democrats in the House and Senate can stop them. The first bill that I will send to the Congress will be to codify Roe v. Wade. And when Congress passes it, I'll sign it in January, 50 years after Roe was first decided the law of the land. But Biden and the Democrats are facing political headwinds on this issue. An ABC News Washington Post poll recently found that voters rank the economy, education, and inflation well above abortion. Terry Moran joins us now. And Terry, I know you've checked in with our partners at 538. Who really has the momentum here, the Democrats or the Republicans? Right now, Lindsay, our poll, other polls show that there is a slight but definite shift in momentum towards Republicans. That's one of the reasons President Biden today at the White House said, remember what you felt like when the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. He wants that electorate, which was very revved up about abortion. Democrats had the momentum then. Our colleagues at 538 stay, say still uh, the Democrats have about a two in three chance of keeping the Senate. That's their analysis. And Republicans are much more favored to win the House. Once again, the 538 analysis there. But you can kind of feel it. The election is slowly but surely shifting towards the Republicans. A lot of time left, and it will all depend on who turns out. Right. Lindsay. We'll see what happens in the next three weeks. Terry Moran, our thanks to you. Two verdicts tonight in a California case that gripped the country for more than 25 years. College freshman Kristen Smart vanished in 1996. Her body was never found. Now a classmate has been found guilty in her murder. His father, who was accused of helping hide her body, was found not guilty. ABC's Mona Kosarabdi has the latest. It was a case that made national headlines. College student Kristen Smart disappeared in 1996. Her body was never found. Tonight, more than 25 years later, that jury finding 45-year-old Paul Flores guilty of her murder, but finding his father, Ruben Flores, not guilty of helping dispose of her body. The father and son had their cases heard simultaneously by different juries. Authorities say Flores killed Smart in his dorm room during an attempted rape on May 25, 1996, when the two were classmates at Cal Poly Tech State University. Smart, prosecutors said, was highly intoxicated, and Flores was the last person seen with her. In the trial, they showed evidence, including soil samples, that they said showed Smart's body might have been buried under the elder Flores' deck. The father and son were long considered suspects, but weren't arrested until last year. Mona Kosar Abdi joins us now. Mona, the sheriff there admitted to some missteps by detectives over the years. Uh, what do we know about the popular podcast credited for helping Kristen's case come to a close? That's right, Lindsay. The San Luis Obispo Sheriff says that this podcast titled Your Own Backyard was crucial in getting worldwide attention on this cold case and also bringing forward key witnesses that eventually led to this conviction. Lindsay. All right, Mona Kosar Abdi. Our thanks to you, Mona. Next to the early season cold that has left 90 million Americans under frost and freeze warnings. And you might be thinking, well, it's fall, it'll be winter soon, it gets cold, move on. But what got our attention is the fact that this cold weather stretches all the way down to places like Florida and Texas, and it's only mid-October. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Barciano joins us now. Rob, how long is all this going to last? A couple more days, Lindsay, and you're right about this. Uh, it has big impacts. When you get this sort of cold coming this early in the season, your, your house isn't ready for it. Your body isn't ready for it. The leaves aren't off the trees, so that'll bring down some power lines if there's wet snow on top of it. So uh, there's, some, there's some impacts for sure when you're talking about cold. And as you mentioned, 90 million Americans in this zone. Let's take a look at the maps. They're awash in blue tonight. Jack Frost uh, certainly busy all the way down to the Gulf Coast. Texas to Florida to the Northeast is where we have freeze warnings that are, are posted. Some of these numbers will break uh, records. Probably see a couple dozen of them by tomorrow morning. Places like uh, Birmingham and Baton Rouge, Atlanta, maybe Nashville.
And uh, where they're below freezing, you're going to want to certainly protect your pets and your plants and maybe in some cases quickly winterize your house. 25 in St. Louis. All right, cold dip in the jet stream in the east and in response to that, a big ridge in the west. So they'll continue with above average temperatures. Records in some cases again tomorrow across parts of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, places like Portland and Medford and Spokane and Seattle are on track for their warmest fall on record, and they're still feeling like summer right now. So certainly a, a two-sided coin of temperatures across the U.S. really the rest of this week, Lindsay. But some places already time to winterize the house. All right, Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. Overseas tonight, with Russia's latest wave of attacks in Ukraine ramping up, Ukraine's president says 30 percent of the country's power stations have been destroyed in the past week. And tonight, President Zelensky is warning with winter approaching, residents may need to conserve. Britt Clinton reports now from Kyiv. Tonight, Russia launching a devastating new wave of missile and drone strikes, cutting power and water to hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians. Video circulating online showing a massive explosion at a thermal power plant in Dnipro. Ukraine, Ukraine. President Zelensky Ukraine. saying nearly a third of Ukraine's power stations have been destroyed, causing massive blackouts, urging his people to conserve energy. The attacks on energy infrastructure designed to cripple the country ahead of the brutal winter freeze. Desperation growing in recently liberated towns in the Kharkiv region where the Russians have used a scorched earth policy. Nine-year-old Artem and his grandmother Irina cooking outside on an open fire. No gas, no electricity. It's really cold, he says. His family now sleeping in a nearby apartment because their windows were blown out. Tonight, the White House saying Vladimir Putin is attacking innocent civilians. Uh, he is trying to make sure that uh, the Ukrainian people suffer. And for the first time tonight, we're seeing new underwater video showing the damaged Nord Stream pipelines in the Baltic Sea. A massive section of the Russia-Germany pipeline missing. Dutch investigators today saying the damage was caused by powerful explosions. With suspicions Russia was likely behind it, NATO already warning of consequences if sabotage is proven. So far, no claim of responsibility. Britt Kleinet joins us now from Kyiv. And Britt, there's late word tonight of new developments in the Russian-occupied Kherson region in southern Ukraine. That's right, Lindsay. Ominous new warnings from Russia tonight as Ukraine pushes on in the south. Moscow-backed leaders now warning the battle for Kherson will begin in the near future, urging civilians to evacuate ahead of fierce hostilities. Now, serious questions about what Putin's next move might be. Lindsay. All right. Brick Clannett, our thanks to you and stay safe as always. When we come back, see the terrifying moments as a woman tries to fight off a kidnapper. She went to prison for leaking more than 700,000 classified battlefield reports from Iraq and Afghanistan. Now Chelsea Manning is opening up about the moment she uploaded those documents and what she wants Americans to know. The U.S. job market is bouncing back from COVID pandemic, but there's a vital industry still struggling. Child care with 100,000 fewer workers since the start of the pandemic, we look at what can be done to keep child care centers afloat. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? 
hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Chilling surveillance video shows the moment a woman was almost abducted in Cincinnati. You can see her walking with a backpack on when a man in a bright orange shirt comes up behind her. He grabs the woman and tries to lead her away as she struggles to fight him off. She manages to break free and runs from the suspect. Police are still searching for him. Now to an issue impacting millions of Americans, child care. When we examined the industry last year, the pandemic had made a staffing crisis even worse. Now educators tell us the sector is still struggling to keep workers. ABC's Karen Travers has the story. The U.S. job market continues to bounce back from the COVID pandemic. Unemployment actually ticking down to 3.5 percent. Despite that good news, one key industry is still struggling, child care. We continue to have uh, staffing shortages. We're about 22 percent short-staffed right now. This is unheard of. I have a couple of classrooms that are not staffed, therefore we don't have children there. The child care sector has lost more than 100,000 workers compared to pre-pandemic levels. That's a drop of 9.7 percent. Experts say the single biggest factor that continues to drive this staffing crisis, low pay for child care workers. It's physically, mentally, emotionally hard work um, and it's one of the lowest paid jobs in every single state in the country. The average hourly wage for a child care worker is just $13.31 or under $28,000 per year. Marcelo Candia is a teacher at Aka Child Development Center in Annandale, Virginia. He works a full day in a classroom of four-year-olds and then heads to a second job nearby just to make ends meet. I work in a grocery store mm -hmm. Uh, so after finish here, I got my other job. So I need to take that in order to pay my bills too. His colleague Nicole Lazart told us she knew her whole life she wanted to be a teacher, but she's questioning how long she can afford to stay in the field. If I wanted to have kids, if I wanted to get married and kind of go to that next part of my life, it's just not really possible. I could do it, and I've seen people do it, but I see them struggle. The child care center directors we spoke to say they're trying to alleviate that struggle, paying their workers more and offering generous benefits and incentives to retain quality teachers. Aka Child Development Center receives funding from the county and state and got federal dollars during the pandemic, but it's still not enough. We are running our program with a 200,000 more or less deficit for this fiscal year because we decided to increase the salaries. Isabel Bolivian says raising tuition isn't an option. The vast majority of children enrolled at ACA come from low-income families. Many work in uh, cleaning companies, uh, grocery stores. A lot of them also work in uh, uh, school systems as teachers or firefighters. 
Last year, Leslie Spina told us that for the first time in nearly three decades running Kinder Academy in Philadelphia, she had empty classrooms because she just didn't have enough teachers. She now says her staffing challenges have gotten worse. She can't compete with retailers and fast food restaurants. We're not paying what Target pays. We're not paying what Chick-fil-A pays because we can't afford to. In the nation's capital, the city government has tried to help daycare workers with grants to centers and an innovative new program that pays teachers up to $14,000 extra per year. Kids Space Child and Family Development Center in Washington is free to families who've experienced homelessness, trauma and abuse. D.C. government funding and private donations have helped it pay their workers more. It's a no-brainer. The child care workers, teachers, anyone that comes in contact with children is just as important as our doctors, our lawyers, our Supreme Court justices. Latoria Myers teaches infants and toddlers. She says the grant gave her financial stability. I'm a single mom, so it helped me kind of get back on a financial balance as far as like paying some things off. Um, actually taking my son on a trip finally, uh, his first plane ride. Child care staffing shortages have a ripple effect across the economy. Courtney Tay, a pre-K teacher in Missouri, is expecting her first child in December. But she's struggling to find care so she can return to her classroom. For most of the centers, they don't have any avail availability until summer or fall of 2023. Courtney says she's fortunate her parents can step in and take care of her daughter until a space in daycare opens up but I've been really surprised by how difficult it is to find a place for her. The Biden administration tried and failed to push Congress to approve major investments in child care and pre-K education. Experts and advocates say until early childhood education is funded like public K through 12 schools, not much will change. If we can't figure out how to have uh, reform of our early care education system, that is driven by public dollars, we're not going to recover from this crisis. The political fight will go on, and educators like Marcelo Candia will continue showing up despite the challenging work and low pay. I love what I do. I, hear, I come here with a lot of energy. I go out of the school when I finish with a boost of energy. There are times when you wake up and think, is it worth it? Should I continue to do this? But I know that I am making a difference in the lives of others. And what would life be if not being here for others too? Certainly making a difference. Our thanks to Karen for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the plane that plummeted into a car dealership and the investigation into the deadly accident now underway. The scathing report slamming multiple online platforms for playing a role in radicalizing the suspect in the racist supermarket attack in Buffalo that left 10 dead. And who might control Congress? It's three weeks until the midterms, and our friends at 538 join us to give us their latest forecast by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Princess Anne honoring actor Daniel Craig with the same award that James Bond received. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 
50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis. The powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them all. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Ready for election night. I'm ready for debate night. I'm ready for it all. This midterms, it's really important. Hi, everyone. We're going to run you ragged. What would George do? You're working on it, George. We're going to make you proud. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Back, everyone. It is exactly three weeks until Election Day. So we're joined now by Galen Drew from ABC News' 538 to break down where the race for the midterm stands by the numbers. Galen, once again, thanks so much for being here. Let's focus on the Senate. I mean, because this changes day by day, sure week does. by week. And so give us a sense of, of the latest idea of which party is going to get control of the Senate. So a month ago, Democrats were favored to keep control of the Senate with about a 71% chance of keeping control. But now, a month later, that's fallen to 62% chance, which is to say that Republicans have an almost 40% chance of taking control of that chamber. They are favored in the House. They are not favored in the Senate, but they are gaining ground. And what is the explanation for that, that tightening that we see in the GOP favor with regard to Senate control? So it's a couple of things. And when you ask Americans, voters, what the most important issue to them is, it's overwhelmingly the economy. Yesterday, we got a new poll out from the New York Times Siena College showing that 44% of Americans say that the economy is a priority for them in this election. That's up from July when it was 36%. Then it falls off dramatically to issues like 8% say the state of democracy, 5% say abortion, another 5% say immigration. So the fact that abortion has become less of an important issue for Americans as the economy has risen advantages Republicans, because when you do ask Americans which party they trust more to handle the economy, it is clearly in favor of Republicans. And, and so much we've been focusing on, on Georgia and Pennsylvania with regard to those two states likely uh, the, the control of the Senate hanging in the balance there. But, but you're really focused in on Nevada as well. Yeah, so Nevada is, according to our forecast, the second likeliest tipping point state, which is a fancy way of saying that it's one of the races that is going to decide which party controls the Senate. And that's a place where we have seen the Republican gain significant ground in recent months. So about a month ago, the Democratic incumbent, Catherine Cortez Masto, was leading her opponent, Republican Adam Laxalt, by about three points. Today, he leads by about a point. So that's a significant shift. Adam Laxalt is the former attorney general of Nevada and was the co-chair of Trump's re-election campaign in the state. And at first blush, you would think, Nevada is a pretty blue state. It has two Democratic senators. It has a Democratic governor, Democratic state house, hasn't voted for a Republican for president since 2004. But that, that sort of veneer hides the fact that Republicans have some advantages there. In fact, Trump lost by only two points in 2020. Um, so while, you know, it's, it's full Democratic control, we shouldn't be shocked if a Republican actually wins that state this fall. In fact, our forecast currently shows it as a 50-50 proposition, a, a true coin flip in terms of who wins. Galen Druk, always appreciate your analysis. We're going to keep having you back here every Tuesday until election night to figure out which way things seem to be, the, the, tails, the scale seems to be tipping. So thank you so much for your analysis. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The new development in the trial for a former sitcom star who's now facing the possibility of life in prison and taken off the band list. Why late night host James Corden was temporarily barred from a famed restaurant and why the owner is now backtracking. But first, we'll look at our Top trending stories on abcnews.com.
With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Wait a minute, you mean now I can listen to GMA any time of the day, anywhere? Yes, that's exactly what we mean with the new Good Morning America podcast. Listen to all of GMA Served Up Daily straight to you. Oh, Michael, Michael. What? Well, I'm listening to our new GMA podcast. <laughs> you got, it's really good. Listen to the Good Morning America podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe now. It's really good. Another barrage of Russian strikes leaving parts of Ukraine, including the capital city of Kyiv, in the dark. Ukraine's President Zelensky says a third of the country's power stations have been destroyed by the recent Russian onslaught, causing massive blackout. President Zelensky condemning the Russian attacks as terrorism, writing on Twitter, no space left for negotiations with Putin's regime. The Kremlin's new wave of Iranian-made drone missiles have been targeted at residential areas in Ukraine, resulting in civilian deaths and injuries. Firefighters scrambling to rescue survivors. Ukrainian forces fighting back. Local Air Force officials say they've used air defense missiles to shoot down 37 out of the 43 drone missiles Russia recently launched. Western intelligence officials believe Iran has been supplying Russia with the weaponized drones. NATO promising to deliver anti-drone systems to help Ukraine's military. A new report issued today found multiple online platforms helped fuel the supermarket mass shooting in Buffalo. The attorney general's report blamed online platforms for radicalizing the teenage shooter and then allowing him to broadcast the attack in real time. New York Attorney General Letitia James calling out 4chan, Discord and Twitch, among others, and called for new laws to address what she called the lack of oversight, transparency and accountability. Opening statements today in the trial of actor Danny Masterson. He faces rape charges after three women say he attacked them two decades ago. The 46-year-old Masterson, best known for his role in that 70s show, pleaded not guilty to charges from three women. Masterson is a member of the Church of Scientology. All three women are former members. They said they delayed going to the police out of fear of retribution from the church. If convicted, Masterson could face 45 years to life in prison. 
Officials in Georgia focusing on a landfill in the search for toddler Quentin Simon, who's been missing since October 5th. Police believe Quentin was left in a dumpster and have started scouring a Chatham County landfill where they believe the dumpster was brought. Officials say last week that they believe the 20-month-old Quentin was dead. The boy's mother, Leilani Simon, was named the primary suspect in the case, but no charges have been filed. A pilot and a passenger killed in a small plane that crashed in the parking lot of a car dealership in Marietta, Ohio. The FAA and National Transportation Safety Board are investigating the crash. Police identified Eric Sievers and Timothy Gifford as the two who were killed. They were the only ones on the twin-engine plane. The crash caused a large fire that officials said took 30 minutes to extinguish. No one on the ground was hurt. Multiple vehicles and buildings were damaged. A famous New York City restaurant has lifted its ban on late-night host James Corden just a day after calling Corden out for his abusive behavior at the Balthazar restaurant. Owner Keith McNally revealed on Instagram that he would welcome the Late Late Show host back after he called to apologize. On Monday, McNally referred to Corden as one of the most abusive customers his staff had encountered since the restaurant opened and detailed two recent incidents where the comedian allegedly mistreated the staff. Corden has not commented on the allegation or apology. Welcome back. Selma and her partner Sasha Farber performed that emotional last dance to all the world needs now is love. And the love was certainly palpable and there for Blair as she made her graceful exit from the ballroom. Here's ABC's Lara Spencer. Bombshell in the ballroom. I can't. I can't go on with the competition. I pushed as far as I could. I'm so sorry, Selma. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sash. An emotional Selma Blair taking herself out of the competition for the sake of her health. It's way too much for the safety of my bones. I could do extensive damage. But not before one final dance. This is a dance for everyone that has tried and hopes that they could do more, but also the power in realizing when it's time to walk away. So I am so, so grateful to be able to do one last gentle dance. Waltzing into our hearts the same way she has week after week with grace, resilience, and love. Everyone in the ballroom shocked and overcome with emotion. Watching you get out here each, each week has been like watching a living, breathing, elegantly dancing miracle. The night, nothing short of perfection. 10. 40 out of 40 for Selma and Sasha. From her perfect scores to her final goodbye, joined by her beloved son Arthur, it was a night no one will forget. Blair, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2018, has bravely shared her journey every step of the way, never holding back, telling Robin Roberts shortly after her diagnosis about the moment she got the news. I cried. I had tears. I wasn't, they weren't tears of panic. They were tears of knowing I now had to give in to a body that had loss of control. And there was some relief in that. When I got the diagnosis, I cried with some relief, like, oh good, I'll be able to do something. And she did, with the support of so many. The 50-year-old actress breaking barriers, raising awareness about the chronic illness. And while it wasn't easy to hang up those dancing shoes. When you put your your energy and heart into something that you didn't know you could, and that you didn't know someone could hold you up. You could stretch and kick if someone's holding you and finding your hands. It's so hard to say no. She leaves the ballroom with no regrets. It's just such a sense of accomplishment to think, oh, I could do something that I dreamed of when I was little. It's so hard not to see these people who are... I know I'm so emotional. I'm so lucky and I'm so sad to leave it. The entire cast celebrating Blair through tears.
Very touching. Our thanks to Lauer for that. Now to my conversation with Chelsea Manning, the former Army intelligence analyst who leaked more than 700,000 classified documents in 2010 to WikiLeaks about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. After spending seven years in prison, her sentence was commuted by former President Obama in 2017, and she's now out with a new book, ReadMe.Text, referring to the name of the file she uploaded to WikiLeaks, making the military secrets public. I sat down with her to discuss the disclosure and what her led her to that point and her journey to find her sexual and gender identity. A number of people are going to say, you know, I already know who Chelsea Manning is and, you know, she leaked classified documents and they feel some kind of way about that. It's the biggest leak in U.S. military history. Their names, their operations. It is an attack on the international community. Right. And so what would you say to those critics? Why should they take the, the time and, and money to actually read your story? I think that my voice and my sort of experience taken as a whole has been left out of this story. You know, everybody's been tr sort of treating me as an enigma, but I'm here, right? And so I'm just trying to tell my story. I'm a little late to the show, but um, I wanted to, to do this. And you're only 34, so you've made it clear this is not a memoir, but really a coming-of-age right. story. Talk to us about, you, you describe a really tumultuous childhood with both of your parents being alcoholics, your mom trying to commit suicide, the divorce, uh, you facing homelessness at a really early age. How did that all, all shape who you have become? Uh, it shaped all of me. Um, any one of those experiences would have been different and it wouldn't be me, right? So, um, you know, I, I did have a difficult upbringing. I mean, there were good, there were good times as well. But yeah, I, I felt, and I still feel to this day, like I was, um, I, I, I always felt underappreciated by my father and I always wanted to just get my father to say, you know, I, I appreciate you, I love you, I am proud of you. Cause it always felt like nothing was good enough for him. You talk about, though, in the book, how your dad seemed to be proud of you when you joined the military. Yes. A and your sister, conversely, you write, she told me I was a dumbass making a stupid impulsive move and that no matter how talented I was, there was no way I'd fit into the culture of the Army. How did you make that decision going from just kind of starting to explore gay clubs at the time right. and then joining the military during the, the height of, of the Iraq War during Don't Ask, Don't Tell? I wanted to rekindle the relationship with my father. Mm. I wouldn't, you know, uh, he kicked me out of the house in uh, 2006, and uh, he had remarried. And um, but I, I felt like there was unfinished business. I think I was also looking for, I was genuinely looking for some way of fitting in in the world, of having stability. And my father kept pitching stability and structure, but. Through all, I mean, in all of this, it was really just, I wanted to feel like I could make a mark on the world and not just be uh, struggling to stay afloat. Some people are gonna hear you say that and say, that's what this is about. You wanted to make your mark on the world. What would you say that this is, that really led you that day to decide to upload more than 700,000 classified documents? Right, I, you know, I, by the time I got into Iraq, in 2010, or in 2009 we deployed, and by 2010, that was when I started to make these decisions, I, I had become very professional. I had this sense of purpose uh, and uh, this sense of I can do something and I can be a part of uh, something bigger uh, and then have that, you know, be uh, having this cognitive dissonance between something that I believe in and really have invested an enormous amount of time and energy into um, be contradicted by the realities on the ground. Come on. What is the truth that you wanted Americans to know? That the sanitized version of the Iraq war up to this point, this discourse had started to be sanitized again and started to be glossed over again. These cycles of retribution, of death and destruction of, of brutality and not having 
the, the public not having any full understanding of this. I wanted to make that available. I wanted that discussion to happen. Well, you write, it's not possible to work in intelligence and not to imagine disclosing the many secrets you bear. So, yes, I would agree with that. On the flip side, though, there are thousands of people who've had a, a similar occupation and they didn't uh, disclose right. classified information. But they thought about it. You think so? I know so. What kept them from doing it? Well, probably the same reason why I, you know, I hesitated, which is, you know, a opportunity, a career. Uh, this, being in the military and, and being in intelligence in itself is a lifestyle. It's not just a career. So in addition to losing your career, you get court-martialed and sentenced to 35 years, which right. was actually the hardest sentence for anyone who would ever lead classified documents. During all of this time, you're also struggling with your, your gender identity, your sexual identity. And so even on that day in the bookstore when you're uploading the documents, you take a picture of yourself with a wig and makeup. Right. And, and you write about gender dysphoria. And you say that it was like a toothache that never goes away. You're right. not always consciously thinking about it, but it's this persistent thing that you can't totally shake that keeps holding you back. When was the first time that you thought about changing um, your gender? Yeah, you know, I didn't realize it was an option until my 20s, right? Uh, I didn't realize that you could seek access to care, that you could get hormone treatment, that you could get therapy, that you could, you know, that surgical options were available. I just didn't realize that, even though I knew something was, that I, I knew I was different at a very young age. It wasn't until I was in the military, and I'd been in the military for a few years, um, by the time I was deployed to Iraq, I, I knew for certain that this is, I needed a transition, that uh, this is the path that I, need, that I need to take in order to survive. And I'd like to read the book dedication. It says, this book is dedicated to the brave trans kids who struggle to live as themselves in a hostile world. You make me proud. Yes. What is your message beyond that to trans kids right now who are struggling and feeling uncomfortable perhaps in their own skin? You know, I went through that experience as a kid. I know what you're going through very deeply. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful that kids are able to even know this kind of information because I didn't when I was that age. And uh, I, you know, I just needed somebody to tell me that I was loved and appreciated for who I am. And that, that's all I want to say to them is that you are loved, you are appreciated, and um, that there is a community. And we've we, we had a progressive moment in the last decade where we've been able to make advances and find ourselves and find our community. We may lose some of that in the next few years, and that's unfortunate, but also we're survivors and we can make it through. I've seen resiliency and survivability and solidarity. Many of these, uh, these laws that have popped up and these, these quote unquote debates that have popped up are going to roll back some of the progress of the last decade. That's not the end of the story. Our thanks to Chelsea for that conversation. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. This potter in New Delhi painting an earthen lamp ahead of the Hindu festival of Diwali. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Over the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. More legal trouble for Ye, why George Floyd's family is reportedly planning a lawsuit against him, and the unsolved mystery behind Netflix's new hit show, The Home, and the chilling letters that inspired the true crime series. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, Mom. 
my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Four close friends who mysteriously disappeared in Oklahoma were killed in a violent shooting in a scrapyard, dismembered and then thrown into a river. According to police, on the night of their murders, the victims planned to commit a crime, but they don't know what the alleged crime involved was. The owner of the scrapyard is a person of interest in the quadruple murder. George Floyd's brother is considering suing Ye, the artist formerly known as Kanye West, over comments suggesting his brother died from fentanyl use. The rapper and fashion designer who legally changed his name to Ye was on a podcast when he discussed Floyd's death at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer. A lawyer for the Floyd family said such comments undermine the Floyd family's fight. A lawyer for West could not be reached for comment. The White House plans to announce another major release of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. A senior administration official confirmed that to ABC News. Just how much oil will be released remains unclear, but Bloomberg and other outlets are reporting a release of another 10 to, 10, uh, 10 to 15 million barrels. The president is expected to address this topic himself tomorrow. And of course, we are just three weeks away until the midterm elections and some key races are starting to heat up. Tonight in Pennsylvania, the battle for that open Senate seat between Democrat John Fetterman and Republican Dr. Oz is continuing to tighten. Fetterman's health and whether Oz is a true Pennsylvanian are issues at the forefront of the campaign. Mary Bruce reports in tonight from Pennsylvania. It's a race that could decide the balance of power in Congress, the battle for the open Senate seat in Pennsylvania. Today, we tried to catch up with the Republican candidate, TV's Dr. Mehmet Oz. In the final three weeks of the race, Oz is laser focused on one issue, casting his opponent, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, as soft on crime. It is shocking that in dozens of cases, he tried to free individuals from their life sentences even over the objections of other members of the parole board. His events tightly controlled. Dr. Oz. Thank you. Dr. Oz, will you answer questions, Dr. Oz? But he was off to another event, a community meeting on fighting illegal drugs. My pledge, because I'm running for a Senate seat at the federal level, will be to, uh, force, for, to be forceful in our closure of the border. Dr. Oz, Afterwards, he was quickly whisked away. Yep. Is that him? Yep, there he goes. <laughs> Two events, no questions from reporters. A sign of the high stakes both candidates carefully managed. Today, Fetterman also refused to take our questions. After suffering a stroke in May, he only recently got back on the campaign trail in full force. So when I'm asked, is he improving or not, I don't know, because nobody knows. Fetterman brushing it off. Dr. Oz has never stopped reminding me about having a stroke. You know, what kind of a doctor roots for somebody that was sick? Stay sick. Fetterman, who's done one recent TV interview with the help of closed captioning, says his stroke gives him new perspective. Now, after having that stroke, I really understand, you know, much more kind of the challenges that Americans have day in and day out because healthcare saved my life. Fetterman has been trolling Oz for being an outsider with 10 homes in multiple states. He only moved to Pennsylvania after announcing his campaign. How many is going to the Eagles game tomorrow? Anyone? Keep an eye out, there's a billboard near the lick that it shows that Dr. Oz is a Cowboys fan. 
That message sinking in for some voters. What do you make of Dr. Oz? Uh, my problem with Dr. Oz might be a nice man, but I don't like someone coming from another state, New Jersey, coming in to run for office. I, I really feel that that is his number one drawback. He's not a true Pennsylvanian. But that doesn't matter to Bob Rinkowski, who says he's voting for Oz. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, what's the difference? I think Fetterman's just doing that because he can't campaign on anything. Our thanks to Mary Bruce. For many Democrats, the right to an abortion is a top issue. And tonight, President Biden has made a pledge that if his party holds Congress, the first bill he sends will protect that right. Here's ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran. Tonight, President Biden with a last-ditch effort before the midterms to rally voters who support abortion rights, promising that Democrats will pass a federal law guaranteeing the right to choose abortion if they win at the polls. Right now, we're short a handful of votes. If you care about the right to choose, then you got to vote. Just three weeks from Election Day, the president is trying to galvanize voters by focusing on abortion, pointing to the restrictions already put in place in at least 14 states where nearly all abortion services have ceased since Roe versus Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court in June. The only sure way to stop these extremist laws that are put in jeopardy women's health and rights is for Congress to pass a law. The president warned that if Republicans take power, they will try to ban abortion at 15 weeks nationwide, noting that Senate Republicans like Lindsey Graham have already introduced such a bill and arguing that only more Democrats in the House and Senate can stop them. The first bill that I will send to the Congress will be to codify Roe v. Wade. And when Congress passes it, I'll sign it in January, 50 years after Roe was first decided the law of the land. But Biden and the Democrats are facing political headwinds on this issue. An ABC News Washington Post poll recently found that voters rank the economy, education, and inflation well above abortion. Our thanks to Terry Moran. Next to the early season cold that has left 90 million Americans under frost and freeze warnings. And you might be thinking, well, it's fall, it'll be winter soon, it gets cold, move on. But what got our attention is the fact that this cold weather stretches all the way down to places like Florida and Texas, and it's only mid-October. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Barciano joins us now. Rob, how long is all this going to last? A couple more days, Lindsay, and you're right about this. Uh, it has big impacts. When you get this sort of cold coming this early in the season, your, your house isn't ready for it, your body isn't ready for it, the leaves aren't off the trees, so that'll bring down some power lines if there's wet snow on top of it. So uh, there's, some, there's some impacts for sure when you're talking about cold. And as you mentioned, 90 million Americans in this zone. Let's take a look at the maps. They're wash and blue tonight. Jack Frost uh, certainly busy all the way down to the Gulf Coast. Texas to Florida to the Northeast is where we have freeze warnings that are, are posted. Some of these numbers will break uh, records. Probably see a couple dozen of them by tomorrow morning. Places like uh, Birmingham and Baton Rouge, Atlanta, maybe Nashville. And uh, where they're below freezing, you're going to want to certainly protect your pets and your plants and maybe in some cases quickly winterize your house. 25 in St. Louis. All right, cold dip in the jet stream in the east and in response to that, a big ridge in the west. So they'll continue with above average temperatures. Records in some cases again tomorrow across parts of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, places like Portland and Medford and Spokane and Seattle are on track for their warmest fall on record and they're still feeling like summer right now. So certainly a uh, two-sided coin of temperatures across the U.S. really the rest of this week, Lindsay. But some places already time to winterize the house. All right, Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. Growing concerns for climber Elnaz Rakabi, who competed in Seoul Sunday without wearing a hijab. Today, she posted a story on Instagram saying she is returning to Iran and apologizing, saying her head covering inadvertently came off, but no one's been able to reach her. Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. Tonight, Iranian climber Elnaz Rakabi, who competed in Seoul without a hijab in violation of Iran's dress code, has not been seen since. It was believed she was traveling back to Iran with the team, but tonight, still no word on where she is. The climber had reportedly stopped answering phone calls. But today, Rekabi apologizing on Instagram, writing, quote, due to bad timing and the unanticipated call for me to climb the wall, my head covering inadvertently came off. But the move was widely seen as an act of defiance in solidarity with protests across Iran, sparked by the death of Mahsa Amini in the custody of the morality police who arrested her for violating the dress code. 
Critics of the government believe Rekabi's apology was forced and now fear she faces punishment. What can happen to her is, first of all, to be sent to prison. She can be forced to confess in front of the camera for national TV. Our thanks to Marcus for that. Two verdicts tonight in a California case that gripped the country for more than 25 years. College freshman Kristen Smart vanished back in 1996. Her body was never found. Now a classmate has been found guilty in her murder. His father, who was accused of helping to hide the body, was found not guilty. ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi has the latest. It was a case that made national headlines. College student Kristen Smart disappeared in 1996. Her body was never found. Tonight, more than 25 years later, that jury finding 45-year-old Paul Flores guilty of her murder, but finding his father, Ruben Flores, not guilty of helping dispose of her body. The father and son had their cases heard simultaneously by different juries. Authorities say Flores killed Smart in his dorm room during an attempted rape on May 25, 1996, when the two were classmates at Cal Poly Tech State University. Smart, prosecutors said, was highly intoxicated, and Flores was the last person seen with her. In the trial, they showed evidence, including soil samples, that they said showed Smart's body might have been buried under the elder Flores' deck. The father and son were long considered suspects, but weren't arrested until last year. Our thanks to Mona. Now to that major headline involving the dossier alleging former President Donald Trump had connections to Russia during the 2016 campaign. Tonight, an analyst accused of misleading investigators about providing some of that information has been acquitted of all charges. Let's get right to ABC's chief justice correspondent, Mr. Pierre Thomas. Pierre, uh, what's the takeaway from this verdict? Lizzie, tonight a jury in Alexandria has decided that the special counsel John Durham failed to prove that the chief investigator on the Steele dossier lied to the FBI about his role. The acquittal of Russian analyst Igor Danchenko on all four counts effectively means that the second significant case Durham took to trial also ended in acquittal. So Durham is winding down his work without a successful conviction of any top government official in connection with his probe of the Justice Department's investigation into Russia's alleged ties to former President Trump. Durham is expected to complete his final report in the coming weeks, Lindsay. All right, Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you as always. Pleasure. Overseas tonight, with Russia's latest wave of attacks in Ukraine now ramping up, Ukraine's president says 30 percent of the country's power stations have been destroyed just in the past week. And tonight, President Zelensky is warning with winter approaching that residents may need to conserve. Brick Clinton reports in from Kyiv. Tonight, Russia launching a devastating new wave of missile and drone strikes, cutting power and water to hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians. Video circulating online showing a massive explosion at a thermal power plant in Dnipro. President Zelensky saying nearly a third of Ukraine's power stations have been destroyed, causing massive blackouts, urging his people to conserve energy. The attacks on energy infrastructure designed to cripple the country ahead of the brutal winter freeze. Desperation growing in recently liberated towns in the Kharkiv region where the Russians have used a scorched earth policy. Nine-year-old Artem and his grandmother Irina cooking outside on an open fire. No gas, no electricity. It's really cold, he says. His family now sleeping in a nearby apartment because their windows were blown out. Tonight, the White House saying Vladimir Putin is attacking innocent civilians. Uh, he is trying to make sure that uh, the Ukrainian people suffer. And for the first time tonight, we're seeing new underwater video showing the damaged Nord Stream pipelines in the Baltic Sea. A massive section of the Russia-Germany pipeline missing. Dutch investigators today saying the damage was caused by powerful explosions. With suspicions Russia was likely behind it, NATO already warning of consequences if sabotage is proven. So far, no claim of responsibility. Our thanks to Britt. Now to a deadly plane crash in Ohio. A small aircraft came down on a car dealership igniting a fireball. ABC's Gio Benitez has the details. Tonight, investigators are trying to figure out what caused a deadly plane crash that sparked this inferno in Ohio. We've just had an explosion of some sort out here towards Walmart, black smoke, sounded like an airplane. The 1974 twin-engine Beechcraft King Air, departing Columbus around 6.40 a.m., bound for Parkersburg, West Virginia, the pilot and a second person on board. Runway 21, clear to land. Clear to land. 
Fast you want. But just moments later, the plane vanishes from radar. Tower, did that plane just go down? Crashing into a car dealership in Marietta. Multiple cars on fire. The plane erupting into this wall of flames and smoke. My daughter, she's 10 years old. I grabbed her and we came running down here to um, see if I could do anything, but there was nothing I could do. The fire engulfing vehicles as firefighters work to put out the blaze. Both occupants were confirmed deceased on scene. Tonight, authorities say there were no reported injuries on the ground. Gio Benitez joins us now from Marietta, Ohio. I, I, Gio, what else are we expected to learn about the moments after the plane took off? So, Lindsay, what's strange about this is they were very, very close to that airport getting ready to land, but something in those final moments changed very quickly and very dramatically. So now the FAA and NTSB are investigating this, Lindsay. All right, hopefully they can get to the bottom of it. Gio Benitez, our thanks to you. Now to the real-life house of the center of the latest true crime hit show where fans are lining up to see it. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has all the details. 657 Boulevard is happy you're here. It's been years since young blood ruled the hallways of the house. It's the show viewers can't look away from. Netflix's The Watcher, starring Naomi Watts and Bobby Cannavale, based on the true story of a New Jersey family whose dream home purchase turned into a living nightmare. All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am The Watcher. And this morning, police tape lining the front steps of the house behind the hit show as fans flock to catch a glimpse of 657 Boulevard, the $1.4 million home Derek and Maria Broadus purchased in 2014 in the wealthy suburb of Westfield. But the idyllic tree-lined street came with a sinister secret. A watcher who sent the family letters threatening to harm them and their children, or what the culprit called young blood. Will the young blood play in the basement? The show featuring chilling excerpts from the anonymous notes. There are many ways in which the story diverts from real life. For one thing, the, the Broadus family never even moved into the home. The outlines of, of what happened are, are there. Despite a police investigation, private investigators and forensic analysts all looking into the case, the watcher was never found. Reeves Weideman is a New York Magazine writer whose article is the basis of the new Netflix series. There was a DNA sample that was obtained from the envelope, and uh, the only thing that, that we, we know um, is that that DNA belonged to a woman. Some questioned if the family planted the letters to get out of the real estate deal. Those allegations were unsubstantiated, and they struggled for years to sell the home, ultimately taking a $400,000 hit. The Broadus family later selling the life rights to Netflix. But they didn't make money when you factor in everything, the loss of the home sale and all the money they spent. Um, it, it wasn't a case where they, they made out great with this. Spooky stuff there. Our thanks to Eva and still to come. Why thousands of Haitians are taking to the streets to protest supplies sent from the U.S. and Canada. As the longest serving black White House correspondent, April Ryan worked through five presidencies, seeing leaders come and go. She tells us about her new book and why she believes black women will save the world. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Shock neighbors laid flowers and candles for a 12-year-old girl who was murdered in Paris. The Paris prosecutor's office said the girl disappeared on Friday and her body was discovered later that evening in a plastic trunk outside of her building. As authorities confirm reports that the suspect had immigrated illegally, the far right and some conservatives said this showed failings in the government's law and order policies. Hundreds of students clash with police outside the Sri Lankan capital of Colombo. The students belong to the Inter-University Students Federation, which played a key role in the protests that led to the resignation of the former prime minister back in May. The protesters were calling out the government for arresting individuals involved in protest under the Prevention of Terrorism Act and demanded the repeal of the legislation. Thousands of Haitians took to the streets of Port-au-Prince to protest against the U.S. and Canadians sending supplies to combat gangs in the Caribbean country. The protests led to the burning of barricades and even looting of a super supermarket. This comes after U.S. and Canadian military aircraft delivered tactical and armored vehicles and other supplies to the Haitian National Police to help combat criminal gangs that have worsened a humanitarian crisis in Haiti. April Ryan is the longest serving Black White House correspondent in history. She joined the White House press corps 25 years ago and her time there has spanned five presidencies. She opens up about her life and work in her new book, Black Women Will Save the World, an anthem, which chronicles her career while also reflecting on the experiences and careers of other prominent black women in power. And joining us now in studio is Miss April Ryan herself. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on the book. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm so excited about the book. So you start with the in the prelude, that moment of the announcement of the nomination of Ketanji Brown Jackson. She's there, of course, with the mm -hmm. Vice President Kamala yeah. Harris. Talk to me about why that moment was so significant and why you felt now was the time to write this book. Believe it or not, as you speak of that, I'm getting goosebumps. Mm. You know, it's so important because We've never seen this before. And there was someone that I had talked to, and I, at the time when um, we were trying to figure out if he was going to listen to those saying that he should uh, have a black woman on his ticket, uh, being a Biden and a black vice presidential candidate, that's a woman, that's a black woman on his ticket. And someone told me, they said, Biden made one promise. It was about the black female Supreme Court justice, and he doesn't operate like that. But guess what? Not only Kataji Brown Jackson, it's now Kamala Harris, Shalonda Young, OMB, it's uh, Susan Rice, uh, domestic policy advisor, it's Karine Jean Pierre, mm -hmm. his presidential spokesperson. This is a moment we've never seen before. I had to stop being a journalist in that moment mm. for a minute to see this white man flanked by two black women. Something that doesn't happen in history. This was significant. You say, Valerie Jowder, of course, the former advisor to, to President uh, Barack Obama. She said, I have a bill of sale for my great-great-grandmother mm -hmm. who she and her children were sold to, a bill of sale just like a piece of chattel. Then she goes on to say, that particular experience of invisibility then and now contributes to what Jared relayed as the imposter syndrome for Jared and many other black women in leadership. Decades of messages that convey that you do not belong are followed by feelings of not deserving to belong once you've made it. If yeah. I were to be honest, I would say I suffer too from, I think from that imposter do. syndrome. Right, we all do because we have the ghosts of the past. You know, the, generation after generation is still dealing with where we came from. And then we, when we sit in these rooms and there are people who want to let you know that, you know, oh, you are, 
Yeah, and tell us about, you know, where you're from. Do we really know? Mm. Some of us, we don't. Some of us do. But nonetheless, when we sit at that table, there's so many people who are so sure of everything. And then when we come to it, it's like, okay, wait a minute. I come from a slave. I, I come from working class, blue collar people. Whereas a lot of the people at the table, white collar, you know, silver spoons. And then when we show up, we bring our existence to the table. And we question, is that enough? Is, for instance, you know, I am an HBCUer, and many of my colleagues are Ivy Leaguers, mm. but I show up and I show up strong. I belong in that room. And we have to realize that we belong in that room. But for Valerie Jarrett, a woman who has steered a president, who has steered world issues, for her to say she feels sometimes that she's an imposter, that sends a strong message. And it lets a lot of us other women know who have not steered presidents, who are just trying to steer their home, trying to steer their workplace, and maybe even the church house, the workhouse, what have you, that there's a commonality mm -hmm. there, no matter how high you rise. And you just said that you show up in the room and you show up strong. Is there a cost to showing up as oh, a strong goodness. black woman? Lindsay, you know this. Yes, there's a price, there's a cost, there's a price. You're isolated, you're the angry black woman. Mm. I did an interview uh, for this book and someone said, tell me why you're angry about the adultification of children. I said, angry? I said, no, if you got that from this book, you're wrong. I said, I'm not playing into the stereotype of an angry black woman. I'm playing into the fact that we are strong, we're resilient in spite of. Mm. And, and when you talk about speaking out in the briefing room, you wrote, I have worked 400% harder to reach the pinnacle of my profession. Mm. Instead of savoring the stage of my career, I felt only heaviness. And this is in particular during the Trump administration. Uh, I felt only heaviness and the burdens of responsibility in the Trump White House. If I didn't ask these questions, who would? If I didn't represent our people in that press room, who would? who could. How important was it for you during that time to be asking those questions? It was one of the hardest times ever for me because I knew every question would be met with the stupidest question ever. Mm. You're a loser. Sit down. You know, can you get the CBC together for me for a meeting? Right. Yes. <laughs> Diminishing my job, diminishing my skills, diminishing my training from Morgan State University, all that I'd put into my career. So at the end of the day, um, there was a cost, but it wasn't about me. And I knew if I left what I was doing, I would look like I was running. Mm. I had nothing <laughs> to apologize for. I did nothing wrong. And I stayed, not knowing that next couple of years in front of me would be 25 years and I'd be the longest serving black woman ever in that White House briefing room. But I stayed because I did nothing wrong. And I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors who are, uh, who were slaves. I'm a descendant, five generations removed of the last known slave in my family. I could keep asking lots of questions. <laughs> uh, uh, we're just out of time, but April, thank you so thank much. You. We want to let our viewers know Black Women Will Save the World, an anthem is available to purchase wherever books are sold. And still to come, a unique welcome for guests at a New York City hotel. Meet the dancing doorman busting move for patrons in the Big Apple. After an extraordinary news-making year, and now with the historic midterms inching closer, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Ready for election night, I'm ready for debate night, I'm ready for it all. This midterms is really important. Hi everyone. We're gonna run you ragged. What would George do? You're working on it, George, we're gonna make you proud. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA-ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Finally tonight, he's been coined the dancing doorman of New York City. Our Janine Elliott caught up with a man who is busting out all the dancing moves right here in the Big Apple. Lenny Favory is not your average doorman. People know me as a dancing doorman. When I'm at the front door, I don't dance all day. I just have fun every now and then when it's quiet. I just play a little music and start dancing. Sometimes I come up with some new dance, but we usually do the dance of the TikTok dance. And it's usually 15 or 20 second dance, and it's easy to learn. And I just teach the people one by one, you know, how it's done, and then we, we do the dance. Lenny has been working as a doorman at the Omni Berkshire Place Hotel in Manhattan for almost 30 years. Welcome to New York City. I'm here to have fun and just make people comfortable when they come to New York. Hey, how you doing? They want to come to New York and see a happy doorman. If you're grumpy, they're going to feel bad. So just as soon as they come in, they give that smile and say, welcome to the Omni. It brightens them up. I started dancing in, in the, the disco era back in the 70s and 80s, and that's how I met my wife. I was dancing the last dance of the night, last dance by Donna Summer. I'm just dancing around, and I saw this girl that just grabbed her hand. And then I started dancing with her. And then 42 years together. And the 64-year-old hasn't stopped dancing since. One of his TikTok videos racking up more than 186,000 views. Lenny even getting the chance to perform on the show Dancing With Myself. I was going to back out because I saw all this competition. And then I said, you know what, let me go for it. And before you know it, I'm in front of millions of people dancing, dancing my heart out. Back at the hotel, Lenny says getting people to dance with him isn't always so easy. Sometimes they say, look, I don't know how to dance. And I tell them, look, I'm not a dancer myself. We do it together. And then before you know it, we're dancing. Lenny not even letting me escape without showing off some moves. Or trying to, at least. I'm a happy person. I love, I love people in general, no matter who you are, where you come from. And I just love to dance and make people happy. And making people happy is good for me. It's good for the soul, and it's good for the mind. So I know there's a lot of bad things happening out there, but if you just do a little dance, if you just do a little move, it'll make you feel good. Lenny turning the front door into the dance floor. We so appreciate it. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news. 